Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Great to see you there, and thank you very much indeed for having come so rapidly in from your visit to the United States to do this talk to us, which is eagerly awaited. We are at the end of uh, three very successful days of conference here. This is the last uh, stage in it, and I gather you very kindly said that you will answer questions afterwards, and we have some questioners lined up, as it were, who will give your questions, and it's up to you whether you take them singly or in groups. Uh, they cover quite a wide uh, spectrum. Uh, you, what you're looking at, I should just explain, is only the central section of the conference room here. There are two wings on either side, which you can't see. So the audience is rather larger than it looks to you. Uh, and we have actually had a very, very good turnout this year at UNA. And we're looking forward with great anticipation to what you have to say to us. Well, well David, thank, thank you very much. And maybe that's an appropriate metaphor for the UN's problem that one can only see part of its supporters at any, at any one time. Uh, the silent majority are always hidden. Um, but it's nice to know you're there. And, and you know, I thought uh, I'd, I'd sort of dive straight in, if I may, uh, onto, if you like, the British reasons for caring about strengthening the United Nations. And uh, if you just look at what's been happening this year in terms of what the Prime Minister's been saying, um, you know, you might actually think that Sam Dawes has a secret desk at number 10, uh, because uh, in Delhi in January, the Prime Minister gave a major speech that announced his vision of the new rules that embrace a new sovereignty for an independent world with international institutions forged in the 1940s, renewed for our times and retooled for the new challenge of the head. And a little earlier, there was his Guildhall speech uh, in November last year. And David Miliband, the Foreign Secretary, has equally made developing effective in international institutions uh, one of the FCO's four new policy goals. And you know, I, as you know, was had to be in Washington uh, yesterday and was actually sort of enjoying before racing back out to the airport to, to get back here, was enjoying a beautiful spring day um, uh, in, 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 in Georgetown. Uh, when my phone goes off and it's the prime minister saying, have, we, have you really got the, the, the plans together for reforming the security sector of the United Nations? So, you know, we've got an incredibly engaged uh, prime minister who's sort of pulling at the bit to get out there with an agenda of, of, of UN reform on particularly pre-conflict, uh, conflict management in terms of strength and peacekeeping and post-conflict in terms of our ability to work more quickly uh, to restore failed states to some kind of reasonable uh, level of governance. And in all those phases of the conflict cycle, he's looking to the United Nations and a reformed UN Security Council uh, to, to be the leading actor. Uh, so, you know, I think we really are very lucky at the moment in that we have a, a, a government which you know, really is uh, devoted to this idea for out and has arrived at it not out of any sentimentality but out of a clear-headed view that a strong United Nations fronting a strong international multilateral system is the best stage for Britain to play on uh, given its global interests but absence of global superpower status in terms of its political and economic tools of influence when it acts alone. So I think you know, in some ways, you've got a UK which is as multilateralist as almost at any point uh, since 1945 at this stage. And if you think just 10 years or so ago, we had a lot less of this kind of agenda. Um, when Tony Blair set out his uh, foreign policy vision in his 1999 Chicago speech, uh, he spoke of liberal interventionism. A powerful idea, certainly, and it was one that recognized that problems abroad were our problems too, and which is an essential building block for, you know, the motivation of a government to want to strengthen multilateralism. And it's an idea, that liberal interventionism, that has lasted. But 
it was, I think, in a sense, had the seeds of its later difficulties in it. If you go back and read that speech, because you see that uh, the case for what counted as, as the moral basis for liberal interventionism was not really one based on a framework of UN-based international rules and norms uh, to govern intervention, to give it the international legitimacy, if you like. It was instead very much more based on the sort of moral premise of a, of a just war. And you know, I think that becomes a, a much harder basis uh, on which to defend interventionism as we have subsequently seen. And so I think a progressive foreign policy today must recognize that the global context has changed and we need to build our institutions and our laws and norms to respect that. Uh, an unprecedented globalization has created connections and networks of goods, people, communications, knowledge, which we all recognize transcend state borders. The lines on the map of globalization don't divide, however, they, they connect uh, the computer technology, which I'm speaking to you today through, was most likely made with parts from five different continents. Something goes wrong and we call the help desk. We're probably going to find somebody in Delhi uh, rather than down the road in Devon who's going to sort it out for us. And in this current global context, countries that participate in these new economic opportunities also subject themselves to the approval of global public opinion, which wearing another hat uh, is also the world's consumers. And in that sense, witness what is happening to China over Tibet. Uh, I suspect ultimately the concern of China's leadership is less the opprobrium which it suspects will pass of Western governments and much more the alarm uh, that China's brand uh, will be damaged in the eyes of politically conscious consumers around the world. And you know, I think this, this, this interconnectedness uh, brings us to the point that when a foreign policy challenge arises, uh, pretty much everything now is global in scale and global in nature, uh, not just the response to Tibet, but from cutting back carbon emissions to conflict reduction, reduction and counterterrorism, almost any problem resolution no longer la remains in the hands of any single country alone, however powerful because none of these challenges can, in general, be contained within uh, sovereign borders. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, I think this new world of globalized foreign policy actually plays heavily to UK strengths, with a history of global, global interconnectivity, a central position in global trade, finance, communications, and other networks. Britain really is ideally placed to take advantage of a globalized world. Now, being progressive in our foreign policy requires recognizing that the networks, the interconnections, and how we strengthen the institutions and rules that underpin them become the tools of really trying to secure change around the world. We're a global hub, at well poised but interdependent, and this is firmly in our interest. But to make the international institutions relevant and responsive to all those in these threads of global connectivity, uh, we have to use, we have to be skillful uh, in our uh, use of the means available to us. And when you think about it, there really isn't another country which enjoys quite such a set of networks politically, uh, where a member of the P5, of the EU, of the, we have the special transatlantic relationship, and we have the Commonwealth. Um, uh, were Britain a Facebook profile, we'd have a lot of friends writing on our wall. Uh, as the Prime Minister said, only with the best inst international institutions that promote cooperation out of shared interest and predictability and accountability can large numbers of states consistently work together for the benefit of all. The UN the only institution, is the only institution where all states have a voice, and that therefore makes it at the very heart of this vision of uh, strengthened international system.